friend on Jan Kore Kohilik, Ian a special to Ian a guni Kore fought. Er in Gedalcha, this mean lam a week as a goal at ten niggas left and colluder at oil or her as act on fault you a darish of Rem Hain as Remavan Kayla Sarvin. Ta a special time come go will me a good doctor here in a reboard Skidelsky, Hokas a walk a Eamon Skidelsky. It is a very great pleasure to be here, and Chairman, and may I say uh, thank you very much uh, for the very, very warm reception I say through you to everybody present, and thank you, Brendan, for uh, that very warm introduction. I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you all at the Institute of International European Affairs. I know also so many of their excellencies are here, and I thank them for their interest uh, in, in what we will have to say uh, this afternoon. Uh, I want to thank Tom Arnold, Director General, and uh, Brendan Halligan, of course, the Chairman of the, the, the Institute of International European Affairs, for organising what will, I hope, be a fruitful debate on ethics, economics, and the significance of the interplay between both uh, for the future of Europe. And I'd like, as I have just said in Irish, most of all, to welcome Robert and Edward Skidelsky to Dublin and to thank them for uh, agreeing to discuss the implication of some of the ideas outlined in their thought-provoking book, How Much is Enough, Money and the Good Life, from the perspective of the European project. For those of you here, and there may be some, but few, who have not read their book, it might be useful to start by introducing very succinctly its core argument. The starting point for How Much is Enough is a lecture entitled The Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, delivered by John Maynard Keynes in 1928 and published as an essay in 1930. In that text... John Maynard Keynes argued that by the year 2030, the economy of developed countries would have lifted mankind to a state of sufficiency, whereby their people would be five to eight times better off and therefore would not have to work more than about 15 hours a week. <laughs> Keynes was right on the former prediction Growth of real income per capita in industrialised Western countries has been in line with his forecast. But he was proved wrong on the latter. According to Robert and Edward Skidelsky, Keynes' expectation that future generations would work only enough to live, as he put it, wisely, agreeably and well, that is to enjoy what the Skidelskys call the good life, was based on a confusion between wants and needs. Indeed, they argue, in conditions of capitalism, there is a satiability of basic needs, but an insatiability of wants. As they put it, capitalism, especially in its modern turbo form, has released the expression of insatiability from its previous restraints, so that the demand for free time has not increased proportionately with income, but well-off people instead tend to work much more than they need to. How much is enough offers a substantive account of the concept of the good life as a means of fettering such insatiability of wants to which I've referred. In Robert and Edward Skidelsky's view, the problem has two dimensions. The first is intellectual. We must, they contend, recover a sense of what money is for rather than pursue it as if it were the, an end in itself. Money is desirable insofar as it allows one to lead the good life, which in their account is made up of seven basic constituents, namely health, security, respect, personality, harmony with nature, friendship, and leisure. The second dimension is political relating to the need to organise our collective existence so as to enable people to live the good life. The Skidelskis thus refute that notions of the good are essentially subjective. That is predicated ultimately on individual preferences, and they raise the question of the role of the state, seen not as neutral arbiter, but as ethically engaged party. The question of the source of ethics has long been a matter 
of debate. Is it to be located in the reformable person, in the shared values of interdependent members of societies? Or perhaps it may be possible to avoid a choice between these two, one that seeks a balance between the good person and the ethical citizen. Much of my recent papers have, been, have sought to address that issue. David Thunder's recent Citizenship and the Pursuit of the Worthy Life is an example of a recent scholarship that pursues this balance. One might, and indeed many of us will, uh, take a different view on the account of the good life put forward in the book. We are also likely to have diverging takes on the relative roles of the individual, the market and the state in delivering the adequate conditions for this good life. These are all matters for political debate, which is not for me to arbitrate. Of greater relevance to my introductory remarks this afternoon is the fact that as a conversation between a political economist and a philosopher, a joint exercise between a father and a son, how much is enough, offers us all a stimulating starting point for what I believe is a necessary discussion of the great challenges that face contemporary Europe. Indeed, the reading of Keynes, proposed by Robert and Edward Skidelsky, recalls for us a time when Western political economy was grounded in philosophical and ethical thought, and economic policy conceptualized primarily in relation to the social objectives at which it was aimed. In particular, in Keynes's case, the objective of full employment. In preparing my remarks for this afternoon, I was struck by the sense of fragmentation that characterizes the contemporary discourse on the future of our European Union. Many of the issues addressed by our distinguished visitors this afternoon reveal this problem, even as to language itself. There is a problem as to meaning with every one of these three words, our European Union. The words our and union have become difficult to grasp when distinctions between the strong and the weak, between debtor and creditor members, between northern and Mediterranean economies are so easily tripped off the tongue. Again, the word European conjures up questions on whether we are speaking of the Eurozone, the wider union, the European space in general, with its proximity to so many contemporary conflicts, some of which have been exacerbated by the absence of any common position that might have suggested such a dialogue as might have eroded fear. The European project, in its essence, we must remember, constituted a promise that sprang from a desire for an alternative to conflicts, Conflict sourced a hundred years ago in the ambitions and the detritus of imperial pretensions. The European community was a pragmatic attempt at cooperation rather than any simple, aggressive neo-mercantilism. And in its best expression, it was an invitation to the peoples of Europe to construct a tapestry of varying colours, textures and images that would make the Europe of the 21st century a union of peace, prosperity, and solidarity. And in that project, Europe has had its visionaries. In the years that followed, Jacques Delors, whose portrait occupies a place of honour on the walls of this institute, was among them. He spoke of a Europe of the citizens, and we must reflect on what happened to that vision. Have we lost it? Is the disconnect between the shards of our broken vision perhaps revealing a deeper malaise at the centre of our intellectual and moral lives? Is citizenship still attainable in a form that might be shared in a Europe that once valued its rich set of sources and diverse cultures? Are integrated models of economic, social, culture and political forms slipping away beyond our horizon? The Europe of the citizens, if it is to be achieved, requires more, I believe, than a revision of thinking by those who are privileged to be given the space for intellectual work. The new thinking required 
has crucially to be informed by the experience of an empowered citizenry who have been given the space not just for existing within the economy, but for reflecting and deciding on what for them is a sufficient, secure, fulfilling and ethical life. If they are to have that opportunity, ensuring, for example, the basic household's capacity to participate in society with all the implications that has for housing, health, education and participation in the public space, must be a central issue. European citizens must be enabled to participate in what Jürgen Habermas might call a deliberative democracy. Social Europe, then, is a project that held together the aspirations of so many potential citizens. But so much has changed. The founders' hopes were crafted before the pressure for a minimal state held sway, before the endless pressure towards the commodification of every aspect of existence itself, as Zygmunt Bauman and others would put it, and certainly before the international economy showed the manifestation of a globalization defined by financialization in international economy rather than trade between real economies. We had lost much, we have lost much of intellectual integration at the time when in 2004 a Nobel Prize winner in economics, a distinguished macroeconomic economist, could declare an open hostility to welfare economics and to theories of distribution. As Thomas Lucas put it in 2004, of the tendencies that are harmful to sound economics, the most seductive and, in my opinion, the most poisonous is to focus on questions of distribution. It is my conviction that the current disjunction between mainstream economic theory and ethical reasoning is one that undermines our intellectual capacity to adequately address the crisis of legitimation which has been facing the European Union for decades. Responding to this democratic deficit, as it is sometimes called, is rendered all more pressing by the centrifugal forces unleashed by the global financial meltdown of 2008 and the vulnerabilities it exposed, for example, in the Eurozone. The consequences of these recent events have been succinctly stated by Jürgen Habermas in his reply to the first question of an interview that was published as the final chapter of his Europe, the Faltering Project. And Habermas had this to say, what worries me most is the scandalous social injustice that the most vulnerable social groups will have to bear the brunt of the socialized costs for the market failure. The mass of those who are, in any case, not among the winners of a globalization, now have to pick up the tab for the impact of the predictable dysfunction of the financial system on the real economy. Unlike the shareholders, they will not pay in money values, but in the hard currency of their daily existence. Viewed in global terms, this emerging fate is also affecting the economically welcome countries, welf wel welfare countries. That is the political scandal. Yet pointing the finger at scapegoats strikes me as hypocritical. The speculators, too, were acting consistently within the established legal framework according to its socially recognized logic of profit maximization. Politics turns itself into a laughingstock when it resorts to moralizing instead of relying on the land of the democratic legislator. Politics, and not capitalism, is responsible for promoting the common good. Of course, the reason for the European democratic deficit are, of course, complex, manifold. They run much deeper than the recent crisis to which Jürgen Habermas is responding. The European Union is a highly unconventional political object, characterized by institutional complexity, shared sovereignty, and competences, intricate political negotiations, and decision-making procedures that involve 28 different polities. This makes, of course, the task 
of articulating a European common good to which a majority of European citizens can subscribe, particularly challenging. More fundamentally, the very notion of a common good is one which Western modernity has rendered problematic. To some extent, the legitimation crisis currently facing the European Union has to do with a much broader crisis of politics and democratic representation, which has seen overarching hierarchies of values and master narratives about the good life fading away from contemporary liberal public discourse in favour of highly individualised conceptions of the good. This was very well captured, of course, by Max Weber, when he described the modern condition as resulting in two closely interrelated developments, the process of rationalisation, of ever greater knowledge specialisation, and technical mastery, which in late modernity peaks in an iron cage of bureaucratic routine and, as he put it, mechanised petrification. And then the process, as he put it, of disenchantment, concluding with the individual's abandonment to a radical polytheism of conflicting values, none of which can claim rational superiority. And thus, he writes at one point, it is not the invitation of spring we face, but the cold icy fingers of winter. Such process of individualization of value is intensified by the dynamics of contemporary global capitalism, which nurtures social atomization and market-based utility maximization. Yet, however bold and demanding the exercise may be, I believe that it is of the utmost importance that we reflect on the possibilities of moral ethical inquiry in making a contribution both to the public economic discourse and to the deepening of democratic practice in Europe. We must, as Jacques Delors put it, Rekindle the ideal, breathe life and soul into it. That is the essential imperative if we intend to give shape to the Europe that we so dearly wish for. Now, this should not be seen as a purely voluntarist exercise aimed at selling some new opium to the masses. Europe, after all, can draw on a rich tradition of pluralist scholarship. They can draw on a model of society based on a particular vision of the balance between the state and the market, between the individual and society, and a conception of international relations predicated on negotiation and a recognition of interdependency rather than forceful intervention. Indeed, from the outside, the European model is often identified not just as an economic model, but as a way of life. And we must be mindful that the current policy of firefighting, however essential the securing of the Eurozone's financial stability may be, does not end up in a social race to the bottom. The European Union will shortly see a new commission, a new parliament, it has seen those already now, a new president of the European Council, and a new high representative have taken up their functions. It is to be hoped that this change of governance will be an opportunity not just to stimulate economic growth, but also to ground more firmly the strategy for growth in an ethical reflection on the social goods which we want that growth to deliver, and for whom. One of the questions raised by how much is enough is precisely that. What is growth for? Has growth become an end rather than a means? The Skidelsky's book is not part of the post-productivist argument. Growth, after all, remains central to their analysis. But they elevate the debate by encouraging us to define the kind of growth that is best able to deliver the basic goods necessary to the good life. That is to sustain an economic agenda that is socially useful and ethically justifiable. This also raises, of course, the issue of the need for public policy to make more ample use of those indicators which perhaps more adequately than gross domestic product are designed to measure social well-being. <clears throat> My own suggestion, for example, which I outlined at the Small Firms Association annual lunch last week, is that in seeking new indicators for the welfare of their citizens and the health of their economies, member states of the European Union might well assess 
the vulnerability of their economies to predatory asset stripping by speculative funds which are neither transparent nor democratically accountable. As we consider the social aims and ethical grounds of European economic policy, I believe too that a focus on the future of work must be central to our discussions. It is another of the great merits of how much is enough that it places work, its nature in capitalism, its future possibilities, and its connection with other areas of life at the heart of the argument. Indeed, the question of good work remains one of the defining issues of our times. Are workers to be seen as isolated units of labour, or can work be conceived again as a wholesome activity within a social context? Can the life of a worker be reduced to description as labour cost, whose fluctuation are ever more defined by casualization and precariousness? How do conditions of work under contemporary capitalism impact on the sharing of employment among the wider population and on demand in the wider economy? What should the respect of roles of the state and the market be in regulating working hours and conditions? What is the social impact of arrangements that encourage employers to hire fewer people working longer hours? Or is there a risk that work sharing might end in people just living on the basic income? And what should that basic income be? All these questions are, of course, complex, and I hope that we will get an opportunity to discuss some of them during our debate later on. And whatever the answers to them may be, I believe that Robert and Edward Skidelsky make an important claim in relocating the issue of work within the wider frame of the good life. Indeed, we might ask, can a worker hope to lead a flourishing life to whom, as the philosopher Simone Weil put it, no good is proposed as the object of his labour except mere existence. At our best in Europe, we have seen how a healthy balance between competition and cohesion and economic policy serving agreed social aims as an instrument of popular will can achieve prosperity and harmony. Here I am perhaps echoing the Lisbon moment. Such necessary balance between economic competitiveness and social and territorial cohesion is present in Jacques Delors' famous triptych, competition that stimulates, cooperation that strengthens, and solidarity that unites. We should never forget that the single market and cohesion policy were launched almost simultaneously as a policy dyad designed to relaunch European integration in the mid-1980s. The creation of the cohesion policy was presented by Delors as a vital counterpart to the four freedoms. This was underpinned by Delors' philosophical acquaintance with social Catholicism and the personalist movement, for whom people are not atomized individuals, abstract and easily transferable units of labor, but persons engaged in active relationships with others and situated in actual distinct social and territorial communities. Today, this cohesion pact, which for several decades has been one of the foundations of the affectio societatis between European citizens, is under threat, both for complex reasons of policy design and because the current crisis has abruptly called into question the principle of solidarity between the various members and regions of the European Union. European integration is indeed, as Habermas puts it, now on a fragile path, torn between the requirements of fiscal adjustment and increasing social discontent. And we must all be concerned, too, by the widening gap described, for example, by such scholars as Dr. Paul Gillespie in a recent paper, between the movement for deeper financial regulatory and economic integration on the one hand and the social solidarity required to give such policies popular legitimacy on the other. I personally believe that the current encroachment of expertise and technocracy over the essential democratic debate is quite a perilous one for the future of European democracy. There is, of course, nothing wrong with technical efficiency, rather the contrary. The danger arises from a conception of economic policy and technocratic administration 
that are governed chiefly, chiefly by the instrumental criteria of a narrowly defined efficiency and success and thus are thus immune to moral normative considerations. We need, I contend, to locate the role of expertise within an accountable system where its function is to clarify choice, not serve as a substitute for the collective deliberation of citizens who are on occasion even dismissively assumed to be economically illiterate. To achieve this, one possible option might be to endeavour to devise a policy frame that is grounded in pluralist scholarship. And so many of our students and graduates across the Union are seeking this, rather than drawing too heavily on a narrow version of economics that has severed all of its ties with its ethical and philosophical sources, except for those deriving from the utilitarian tradition. This is not going to be easy. The portrayal of ethics as soft, in contrast to the hard science of economics, is simply poor theoretical work. Indeed, the invitation to view the world as rational calculating utility maximizers has inflicted deep injuries on our moral imaginations, on how we conceive our relations with others, and indeed with our natural environment. And the recent economic and financial upheavals have also thrown a glaring light on the shortcomings of the intellectual tools provided by mainstream economics and its key assumption regarding the sustainability of what were called self-regulating markets. Responding to this intellectual failure requires more than an adjustment of the modelling techniques and forecasting tools used by many economists, or at an institutional level, a tightening of banking supervision. It requires, I suggest, the formulation of a public discourse on such issues as the possibility of having a pluralism of policy responses that would enable the member states of the European Union to address their citizens' concerns on, for example, unemployment and growing inequality, and I believe that both unemployment and growing inequality are issues that are both urgent and important. I believe that there is a unifying capacity and a great force in an appeal towards making a fresh beginning in the crafting of our shared European space. We will inevitably have to discuss in coming decades not just integration in its fullest sense, but also such issues as what we will regard as work itself. I've already quoted Simone Weil. Let me quote her words again. In Gravity and Grace, published in 1947, she wrote, Man's greatness is always to recreate his life, to recreate what is given to him. Through work, he produces his own natural existence. Through science, he recreates the universe by means of symbols. Through art, he recreates the alliance between his body and his soul. It is to be noticed that each of these three things is something poor, empty, and vain, taken by itself and not in relation to the others. Union of the three, a working people's culture, that will be not just yet. Those words were written 70 years ago. Now we must take our responsibilities in our condition. We must do our work in our different ways, in intellectual, manual, and artistic work, in politics and science. And how much is enough makes a significant contribution towards the formulation of a renewed economic discourse for Europe, one that does, no, that does not lose sight of ethical aims. With such a discourse, it is possible, I believe, to overcome Habermas's melancholic remark Today, all that remains of Enzenberger's eulogy to European diversity, Europe, Europe, is the sighing tone. On such grounds, we can start a fresh discussion on the kind of prosperity and security and solidarity we wish to bequeath to future generations of Europeans so that their possibilities may indeed live up to the hopes that Keynes had for his grandchildren. Dr. Emile Mark.